Okay, let's get started. Um, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. We're talking about uh, saving for development in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is a report that came out in the last six months. Uh, the two author, or the two editors, uh, uh, Eduardo Carvalho and Tomas Zerbrisky are here. They're both uh, economists with the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, I think this is not just important for the region, but this is important for the much larger development conversation. We're having a pre-game discussion earlier, and uh, I was asking, okay, well, what's the size of saving and what's the size of savings? And I got percentages of GMP. I said, okay, but that's not interesting to me. Tell me what the dollar amount is, because I need some kind of headline dollar amount to get people to, to pay attention to this. And they said, okay, well, it's maybe one of them is 17%, and the other is, you know, 100% of GNP. So, well, what's the GNP of Latin America? I said, well, it's $5 trillion. They said, okay, well, what's, 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 so that means it's $700 billion is saved, one of them, and the other one is five, you know, it could be 50% or 100% is the other, so it could be $5 trillion. I said, okay, well, let's compare that to taxes collected in Latin America. So, if you had $700 billion, or so for, for some kind of saving, and then you have a $5 trillion for another kind of saving. Um, you know, taxes is something like a trillion. So this is, this is as big or much bigger than that. And I said, well, what's, how much does the IDB land and the World Bank land and the EU land and the US government land give and Japanese government give? What's the total of all that that goes to Latin America? And I said, and it's something like between 10 and, and 20 billion dollars a year. So it's teeny. This is much teenier. And I said, well, how much is remittances? Because that's a big number. There's a lot of talk in, in the, remittances are a big number. That's like 300 billion dollars. This is multiples and multiples of taxes. This is multiples and multiples and multiples of ODA. This is multiples of remittances. So these are really big numbers. If you can channel them, if you can manage them, that's, that's the point. Now, we have two very thoughtful commentators who I'm really grateful have taken time to help us. <clears throat> we have Augusto de la Torre, who's the former chief economist at the World Bank for the Latin America Department, and is now in academia. And then my very good friend, Mildred Kalir, who is the CFO of OPIC, and also has had a career both in government, but also in the private sector, and has thought a lot about mobilizing private capital. So we have two very thoughtful respondents to the presentation you're gonna see now. So, so the point of this is, these are humongous numbers. This is the great white whale of development. This is bigger than taxes. We spend a lot of time in development talking about domestic resource mobilization, which is usually used as a fancy bumper sticker for taxes. But domestic resource mobilization is, is just as much about this as it is about taxes. So this is an important topic. It's a timely topic. It doesn't get the right kind of attention and the right kind of, there's roles for institutions like the IDB. There's roles for institutions like the European Union. There's roles for institutions like donors like the German government or the United States. And so that is why I wanted to convene this discussion because I think it's very timely. It's, these are humongous numbers, and we need to get a handle on them, and then we need to think about, well, what, what, what is to be done with this information? So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over the floor to my friends Eduardo and Tomas. Yes, for organizing this event, especially to you, Dan, uh, and your team, um, and of course to Augusto and Mildred for reading the book and providing comments. Um, so There's going to be a quiz afterwards for everybody here if they've read the book, yeah, right? I'm sure they all read the book. And if you haven't read the book, uh, you have the link there to download it. Uh, not only the book, but also all the working papers that we commissioned for the preparation of this book. Uh, so I'll make the first half of the uh, presentation, and then Eduardo Cavallo, the other co-editor, will, will continue. Um, let me start. You know, in Latin America, in the uh, public policy space of Latin America, we talk a lot about um, problems of fiscal deficit, uh, current account imbalances, the very low investment levels in the region, uh, balance of payment crisis, uh, problems of uh, low pension coverage. So underlying all these um, problems, there is a common denominator, and that is that Latin America and the Caribbean has a very serious saving problem. Um, so a 
concrete manifestation of the saving deficit in the region is closely related to uh, pensions. In Latin America and the Caribbean, less than 50% of the workers uh, contribute to a pension system. Uh, be it, you know, uh, pay as you go or defined contribution. And given that uh, contributions to pension systems are the main uh, saving vehicle for retirement, this lack of contribution makes clear that the region has a saving deficit that is that puts the uh, senior population at risk and a risk that is in, will be increasing in time and we'll see why in a few minutes. Another manifestation of a saving deficit is the low quality of infrastructure that is caused by the very low investment in infrastructure in the region. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the perception of quality of infrastructure in the region as reported by the World Economic Forum is much lower in Latin America than in advanced economies or in emerging Asia. The, the problem or the worrisome fact is if you see the trend of sub-Saharan Africa, soon Latin America will end up as the worst uh, quality, uh, the worst region in terms of uh, perception of quality of infrastructure. So we don't, in the book, only convey bad news. Um, on the contrary, we say that the region can do better. The region can get away from the current trap uh, of low and bad savings. And to that end, we need to understand, say, the first, first the nature of the low and bad saving problem in Latin America. And the traditional wisdom says that uh, economies save for, re for a rainy day, for rainy days ahead. Uh, and saving has a negative connotation, I'm sure, for you all. Why? Because we sacrifice consumption today to prepare ourselves for a possible negative shock outcome in the future. So the, the core idea uh, of the book is that uh, economies in Latin America need to save for rainy days ahead. Um, so a concrete manifestation of the saving deficit in the region is closely related to uh, pensions. In Latin America and the Caribbean, less than 50% of the workers uh, contribute to a pension system. Uh, be it, you know, uh, pay as you go or defined contribution. And given that uh, contributions to pension systems are the main uh, saving vehicle for retirement, this lack of contribution makes clear that the region has a saving deficit that is that puts the uh, senior population at risk and a risk that is in, will be increasing in time and we'll see why in a few minutes. Another manifestation of a saving deficit is the low quality of infrastructure that is caused by the very low investment in infrastructure in the region. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the perception of quality of infrastructure in the region as reported by the World Economic Forum is much lower in Latin America than in advanced economies or in emerging Asia. The, the problem or the worrisome fact is if you see the trend of sub-Saharan Africa, soon Latin America will end up as the worst uh, quality, uh, the worst region in terms of uh, perception of quality of infrastructure. So we don't, in the book, only convey bad news. Um, on the contrary, we say that the region can do better. The region can get away from the current trap uh, of low and bad savings. And to that end, we need to understand, say, the first, first the nature of the low and bad saving problem in Latin America. And the traditional wisdom says that uh, economies save for, re for a rainy day, for rainy days ahead. Uh, and saving has a negative connotation, I'm sure, for you all. Why? Because we sacrifice consumption today to prepare ourselves for a possible negative shock outcome in the future. So the, the core idea uh, of the book is that uh, economies in Latin America need to save for rainy days ahead. That is, economies need to save more and better to generate the conditions for higher rates of growth, sustain higher rates of growth, and to have more inclusive societies. So let me start by showing you some numbers of where the region stands today in terms of savings, the numbers that uh, Dan uh, mentioned in his introductory remarks. Latin America and the Caribbean save on average 17% of its uh, GDP. This is a number that is much lower than emerging Asia that saves over 33% of the GDP, 
and even lower than the average of advanced economies that save more than 22%. The only region that saves less is Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's a much less uh, developed region than uh, Latin America. Unfortunately, this is a, not a new situation for Latin America. At least since the 1980s, Latin America has constantly saved less than emerging Asia and advanced economies. Even, as you can see in the period of commodity boom of the uh, 2000 or mid-2000s, uh, the saving rates in Latin America couldn't match the observed rate in advanced economies. But who saves in a country? In a, uh, total savings in a country is the sum of uh, the savings done by three, what we call in economic, three economic agents, households, firms, and governments. And this is the share how they split uh, savings. 35% uh, uh, households, 60% firms, and 5% uh, governments. And these shares, these percentages, are very similar in Latin America when compared to other regions of the world. So then the problem in Latin America is not that much who saves, that is these three agents, but rather how much is saved in total and in particular, how uh, that, uh, those savings are allocated in the economy, how uh, the resources are put to work. And how should this work? In a textbook case, textbook, uh, textbook economy, <coughs> oops, sorry. Um, the uh, savings done by households, firms and the government is channeled through the formal financial system that is banks or capital markets and then is allocated to the most productive uses in the economy. Again, unfortunately, this is not how it works in Latin America. We just saw that households, firms and governments in aggregate don't save that much and the vast majority of, that, of those resources do not go through the formal financial system and goes to finance uh, consumption, um, investment or the self-financing of investment through uh, family firms or to stash cash, what we uh, call in Latin America, saving under the mattress. So let me zoom in on household, uh, in, on saving decisions of these three agents, starting by households. We just saw that households are not the main generator of savings in, in the economy, but household uh, savings are very important for the well-being of um, individuals and, and their families. For the uh, preparation of the book, we carried out several surveys to understand what, uh, why people save for, what people save for, and among the, all the answers, the one that drew our attention was a very low percentage of people that declare they save for retirement. And let me show you uh, more in detail this, uh, this result. For all income deciles in the uh, distribution of uh, income, the percentage of workers that declare that they save and at the same time they contribute to a pension system, that is a blue line, is always higher than the share of workers that declare that they save but do not contribute to a pension system. So what is this result telling us? That voluntary savings are not making up for lack of sufficient contribution to pension system, that is, uh, for uh, savings. And that's why the, the book makes a strong call uh, to save uh, pension systems in the region. And, and countries need to act now. Why? Because the region is starting to age, and is starting to age fast. And I'll show you the data on this. Um, as you know, Europe is a region that is already aging. It enjoyed a, a long process of demographic boom, but now it's, uh, the uh, dependency rates are increasing, and are increasing fast. On the other extreme, we have Africa, a very, uh, low, a very young region that has a, a long period of uh, demographic boom ahead. And in between, we have two regions, Asia and Latin America, that, as you can see, have very similar paths of uh, the dependency rate. It increased up to 1950, and then came the uh, process of rapid demographic boom. And now, probably in these years, the, uh, that demographic boom is ending, and the regions will start to age. What is the most important difference between the two regions is that in the, pro in the period of demographic boom, 
Asia uh, saved and saved a lot, and Latin America hasn't done so. So um, somehow this, this problem of the pension systems has been um, minimized in, in the region. And sometimes the debate has been, uh, say, ideological on whether the uh, pay-as-you-go system is better than defined contribution. And, and the book um, makes, a, again, a strong argument that what needs to be done is, is solve, fix the structural problems of both systems that are mainly explained by lack of contribution. Uh, not too many people contribute, as I showed before, and contributions are not high enough. Um, and if you go, if you see what's going on with uh, the pay-as-you-go systems, the really a worrisome result is that they are already in benefit, in, in deficit. Benefits exceed contribution in most of the uh, countries, and we are in the period with the lowest dependency rates. So the situation will get worse and worse in the future if countries don't act. When it comes to uh, defined contributions, the, the book argues that they are not necessarily a fix. And why not? First, because if uh, contributions uh, need to go up, and that's uh, explained by uh, participation, by informality, that in the region is, is very high, as you know. Then transitions from um, pay-as-you-go system to defined contribution are very uh, expensive and take, uh, take a lot of uh, long time. They usually, in some of the countries, exceed 3% of GDP. And then, if savings fall short, if the returns of, the, of those savings are low, uh, the governments will need to uh, step in and uh, to avoid old age uh, poverty. That has already happened in, in some of the countries, like, for example, Chile. So going beyond pensions, households have other obstacles for uh, savings, to increase saving. Some of them are related to social pressure. And as you know, in Latin America, the network of friends and family uh, is very important. And that makes uh, saving by, by those in the household that want to save more and can save more very difficult, because people come and ask for uh, informal loans, please lend me money. So it's, it's very difficult. Uh, to save. Uh, the book presents the, the latest evidence on uh, behavioral economics that is studying these behavioral biases, or call them behavioral biases, and are related to uh, impatience, inertia, limited attention, the penchant for instant gratification that makes saving uh, difficult. Uh, it even explores the uh, role uh, in the literature that uh, genes, culture, and even language have in explaining uh, saving rates. So what the, at the end of the day, what the book uh, does is uh, make a, makes a strong argument to uh, develop a saving culture in Latin America and the Caribbean. And, and this is important to highlight. The book doesn't uh, recommend to change the behavioral biases. That's very difficult. On the contrary, what it does is say that uh, countries need to un identify, understand the behavioral biases, and include them in the design of uh, financial instruments to facilitate uh, saving. And, and to that end, what we need to do is improve, innovate on financial education, and start with uh, the younger, with the, the kids at an early age, because we know that that has a long-term impact on, on saving rates. Um, and, and the book describes many uh, experiments to increase uh, saving rate. Uh, several examples in Latin America and in other regions. Here uh, we present one in Chile targeted to uh, micro entrepreneurs. Were, uh, a target uh, a group was uh, a treatment group was offered the possibility of having regular meetings where uh, saving rates uh, and targets were. Uh, said and uh, uh, say discussed on how, uh, methods how to uh, comply with them or meet them, and the results were very promising when compared to the control group. Uh, the number of deposits grew uh, more than three times, and the average savings balance almost uh, doubled. So we talked about the problems of or lack of sufficient contribution or savings for retirement obstacles that are behavioral base for, for household savings, but households face other 
um, obstacles uh, to save, and these are uh, obstacles to save in the formal financial system in the region. And, and the book shows that there is a bias against uh, formal savings. This is uh, information from the World Bank, and what we can see is that uh, the percentage of people that have bank accounts in, the re in Latin America and the Caribbean is lower than in emerging Asia, in advanced economies, even though the region has made good progress, or, or uh, quite good progress. But the problem is in the use of those bank accounts to save. So people actually don't, don't use the bank accounts that they have uh, to save, so the numbers are much lower than uh, in Asia and uh, advanced economies. So why is this so? Uh, what are the obstacles? Well, the first one is uh, related and the most intuitive to high cost. It's very expensive to uh, use the formal financial system to save, and Eduardo will explain in detail this reason. Uh, the second one is limited financial access. And as you know, banks have all the incentives to uh, increase coverage, open up branches only when they make uh, benefits out of it. And Latin America is a geographically very uh, large uh, region, so banks don't have uh, too many incentives to open up uh, branches in, in rural areas that tend to be poor or peri-urban areas where there is a high concentration of poverty in the region. So here the book calls for government intervention to have an open-minded approach to provide eventually subsidies to private banks to increase coverage or to rely on public banks, and then it describes the, um, the role that technology is having. There is a promising way to increase coverage. And then the, the last um, reason is lack of trust. Latin America has made uh, very good progress in financial regulation, in making the financial system more robust to, to crisis. But when it comes to households, you cannot ask people to trust something that they don't know. They don't know how it works. And uh, evidence, clear evidence comes from uh, Chile, for instance, probably the most advanced country in the region in terms of financial access, where less than 50% of the people are familiar with basic financial concepts like inflation or interest rate. So again, here the book calls for a more and better uh, financial education. And then we go to firms. Okay. Thank you, Tomas. Let me pick up from where Tomas uh, left. Let me join Tomas in thanking Dan and CSIS for hosting us and giving us the opportunity to present this book here. So Tomas has uh, already talked about uh, one of the engines of saving in the economy, which is households. Uh, now let me talk a little bit about firms, which is, by the way, as we showed at the beginning, the main engine generating savings in an economy. So why do firms uh, save? Firms basically save to invest. What, what do we mean by firms' savings? So when firms operate, they make profits. They can either distribute those profits uh, to their owners, or they can retain part of those profits. To the extent that some of those profits are retained, those retained earnings, in a sense, are part of the are what we call the firm uh, savings. And firms retain earnings because they need resources uh, to invest. They do it in Latin America. They do it everywhere in the world. Actually, when you look at how a, a firm investment is financed, what you observe is that about 60% of the investment of firms is financed by retained earnings, by firm saving, and only 40% is financed by accessing credit, say, from a bank or a thing like that. And these numbers are from Latin America, but if you look at the numbers or the shares for countries with more advanced financial systems, take the case of Germany, for example, you will see that the ratios are 50-50. So everywhere in the world, firms save a lot to be able to invest. And they do that because by doing so, they save themselves the cost of financial intermediation. Getting a credit from a bank carries a cost, and if you finance your investment through your retained earnings, you avoid paying that cost. So that's why firms always have incentives to save to be able to invest. Of course, when investment opportunities are very big or there are too many investment opportunities, you can know 
uh, you can, you can uh, not only rely on your capacity to save internally, you need access to credit, and uh, therefore external credit, credit external to a firm, is a necessary complement to be able to finance uh, investment. But when you think about it, for there to be credit in an economy, somebody has had to save, and those savings have to be channeled through the formal financial system, which is the set of institutions in the economy that aggregate those savings and generate the credit. So there's always a saving decision behind any investment decision made by a firm, be it by the retained earnings or be it by credit. Somebody has had to save to be able to generate that investment opportunity. That's why saving and investments are always two sides of the same coin. Which take us to look at the issue of investment in Latin America and the Caribbean. How much investment does, or how much investment do our economies need? Okay, so let's take, for example, the number that the Commission on Growth and Development, a commission integrated by many notable people, including Nobel laureates in, economy, in economics, the they have. Report. This is the Spence report. Uh, this is what's, what's called the Spence report. Yes, thank you, Dan. This is what the Spence report came out as the figure of what economies like Latin America and the Caribbean need to invest on a sustainable and persistent basis for a long haul to be able to grow and achieve the uh, uh, inclusive growth targets that they have set forth. And they come up with this 25% number. They say that countries need to invest about 25% of GDP per year. When we look at the investment rates in Latin America and the Caribbean, on average, over the last 30 years, we have never, never achieved that figure. So not even during the commodity price boom period of the early 2000s when we had an income windfall, we were able to invest as much as the Spence report suggests that countries like Latin America and the Caribbean need to invest. Which leads us to the question of who is to blame for the low investment. And here's where the economic profession is uh, divided. Many people think that, you know, lack of investment has to do with lack of investment opportunities. The investment climate does not help. And others think uh, that there is an issue uh, of a, a lack of financing opportunities, which is related to the saving problem. You know, both Tomas and I, if you haven't figured out, we are from Argentina. In Argentina, you dance the tango, and we have a say there that uh, it takes two to tango. And on this issue, we think it takes two to tango. So those who think that the financing is not really to blame here, or it's not really what uh, is driving the problem, what they have in mind is an open economy model where you, if you don't have the savings domestically, you can always import those savings from abroad. You can always rely on external indebtedness to substitute the lack of savings. Well, you know, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of experience trying to do this, and it usually hasn't ended very well. Foreign saving is very risky, uh, and it cannot really replace the lack of uh, national uh, saving. Importing saving, as I said, can be very risky, and the experience with balance of payment crisis and financial crisis and currency crisis in the region has uh, been very complex. And uh, uh, the, 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 the main argument to be made here, I think, is quite an intuitive one. Uh, why would we expect foreign investors to come and lend to countries in the region for the long term at significant amount of money and at low rates? if we don't show that the uh, citizens in our countries are willing to invest their own savings? Why would we expect foreigners to do what we locals do not do ourselves? So it's really important in our view to uh, mobilize national saving, uh, to be able to generate a better uh, foreign saving coming to our countries, not as a substitute, but as a complement. But of course, you know, Financing is not everything. You may have the financing, but if you don't have the good investment opportunities, that financing will not be put to good uh, uh, use. And unfortunately, we live in a region, Latin America and the Caribbean, where oftentimes the investment climate sends the wrong signal. And this brings us to uh, an issue of, well, then how do we do to generate more and better savings for firms, more investment opportunities for firms, we think we need to unleash the forces of productivity growth in the economy to do that, which 
is related to a research agenda that we have been pushing at the Inter-American Development Bank for many years now that has to do with issues related to improving regulations, improving the quality of the infrastructure that we have in the region, which as Thomas was saying was very poor, consolidate macroeconomic stability, and something that is critically important to me, set stable and clear rules of the game so that everybody, everybody, local investors and foreign investors know what are the risks and what are the opportunities that we face in the region, something that we still need to do uh, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Let me now talk a little bit about government savings, which is a very difficult topic to treat because when we talk about government savings, we're talking about public savings here. Usually, the common wisdom is that the only way to generate public savings is either to increase taxes or to reduce public expenditures, which, you know, it's very difficult to do. And in the political context that we live now, it's almost probably impossible to do on a generalized basis in Latin America and the Caribbean. So what can we do about uh, public savings without falling into this political impossible uh, uh, task. Well, we think that there's a better way to generate public savings. And actually, as I said, in the current context of the region, probably the only way to generate uh, public savings uh, is, is as follows. The first is to realize that not all, not all public spending is the same. Actually, when you look at public spending, there are two main categories. One is current expenditures, which is basically government consumption, which is what the government spends in, 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 in paying wages and, and buying the things that it needs for the government to operate, current consumption, as we call it. And there's capital expenditures, which is what the government actually invests. And only the current component of government expenditures is consumption. What the government uses or the resources the government uses to invest is actually saving. It's putting resources away to invest for the future. Now, when we look at, when we look at how current expenditures have behaved in the region and comparing to how capital expenditures have behaved, current expenditures is the blue line there. That has increased in real terms more or less monotonically over time, while capital expenditures have fluctuated a lot more. Actually, we have studied the cyclical components of this. All economists go through what we call a what economists call a business cycle. Sometimes things are going well, sometimes things are on the downturn. So we looked at the patterns of public expenditure in both components over the cycle. And what we find is that in Latin America and the Caribbean, in good times, both current expenditures, that is government consumption, and investment go up, but consumption goes up more than investment. And during bad times, when we are in recessions and we have to cut expenditures, the only thing that really falls is investment, not consumption. So when you think that the business cycle repeats itself over time, what this is showing is that the way fiscal policy is actually implemented in the region builds in a bias against public saving because it's a bias against uh, investment. So we need to understand this because the only solution to this problem is design fiscal rules, as we, call, as we economists call them, fiscal rules that protect the capital expenditures over the business cycle, and this is something that we still need to do a lot of progress in the region. Then, uh, the other way of generating public savings in Latin America and the Caribbean is reducing expenditure leakages, which is another way of saying increasing the efficiency with which we spend. And let me give you a few examples. Dan likes numbers, so I'm going to give him numbers. So uh, the numbers are, are the following. So we have looked at for example, all uh, three very important categories of current expenditures in Latin America, which are uh, social assistance programs, energy subsidies, and tax expenditures, which are basically tax exemptions that uh, we give to try to help certain segment, segments of the population. In these three categories of expenditures, the legislator, what he had in mind at the moment of providing these subsidies is to try to help a targeted group in the population, typically the poor people. That's the objective. Okay? When you look at who are the recipients of these uh, uh, subsidies, what you observe is that the poor receive them, but also people who are not poor 
are receiving them. Because many times these programs are not well targeted. If you add up those resources, if you add up how much the people who are not really poor are getting out of these transfers, you find these are the numbers for uh, the, the countries which we were able to, 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 to do this uh, analysis. But on average, you find about 2% of GDP, 2% of GDP in resources that could be saved by the public sector just by targeting public expenditures better. If you add to that categories of spending like in education and health, where we don't do a particularly good job in being very efficient with the spending that we do, on average, you can add an additional 1% of GDP for the region in terms of savings that could be generated. So Dan, what are the potential savings on these two categories? They are 3% of GDP, which in numbers is $150 billion. So we could be saving, the public sector could be saving $150 billion a year just not by cutting expenditures, not by increasing taxes, just by being a lot more efficient in the way we spend the resources that we currently spend. This is not a theoretical argument, this is a very practical argument. Mm -hmm. And to put this into perspective, this is the amount of resources that people like Tomás Terebrisky, who work on infrastructure in Latin America and the Caribbean, claim that the region needs to invest more every year to close what we call the investment gap in infrastructure in the region. So let's think about this. Just by being more efficient in the way we use the resources, we would be able, in principle, to generate the amount of money needed to close the infrastructure gap in Latin America and the Caribbean. Again, this is not a theoretical argument. This comes out of the calculations that we have made looking at public expenditures in Latin America and the Caribbean. So, Tomas talked about household savings, I talked about firm savings and the government. The missing link in all this is an efficient financial system because the financial system is the set of institutions in the economy that collect the savings and allocate them to productive investment. And unfortunately, on this topic, the region is doing a really bad job. And this is problematic because that explains why productivity growth is not, uh, is, is one of the reasons why productivity growth is not large enough in the region. And, and, and this is a serious problem. Why? Because when you look at uh, episodes of increases in saving around the world that have not been accompanied by increases in productivity growth, and you compare them to episodes where there has been increase in saving, and at the same time there has been an increase in productivity, only in the last case you observe that there's an impact of GDP per capita in the medium and in the long run. So it's very important that the resources that are generated through more saving are put to good use in the economy, that raise productivity growth, and that will create the incentives for long-term uh, 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 saving to, to, to have a, a, an impact on, on, on investment. Now, I said, unfortunately, our financial system that's not good, at, that, that does a good job at doing this. There are many measures of inefficiency in our system. When you look, for example, at how costly it is uh, to operate with the financial system, you find something called the spread between the rates at which uh, banks lend and uh, the, the, the interest they pay to, to depositors. And you want the spread to be low, and actually when you look at average spreads in Latin America and the Caribbean, they are closer to what you observe in Sub-Saharan Africa, far above the levels you observe in advanced economies or in emerging Asia, which creates what we in the book call a vicious circle. A vicious circle that starts with the problem of low saving, generating a limited amount of supply of loanable funds in the economy. If there's not enough saving, few resources are being channeled to the financial system that limits the size of the financial system. Having a small financial system generates the high unit costs of operation that Tomas was referring to, so it makes it very expensive for many people to operate through the financial system. If you add to add other distortions that are typical in financial systems in Latin America, that is behind the problem of misallocation of savings in the region, which is 
the culprit or one of the main culprits for low productivity growth in the region. And a low productivity growth region is a region that is not generating signals or incentives to save and sort of feeds back into the saving problem. So we need to find ways of breaking this vicious circle. And in what it relates to financial policies, in the book we stress three critical aspects. The first one is we need to lower the unit cost of operations of the financial system. And a good way of doing this is creating more incentives for people to use the financial system as the main vehicle to save. We need to expand the customer base. Is fixed cost can be expanded or spread over a larger customer base, unit cost will go down. And this will require changing the focus that we have been putting on financial inclusion policies in the region from just merely access to access plus use. We need to create incentives. There's a market development problem here. We need to create incentives for people to use the financial system as a main vehicle to save. And in the book, we explore and we can, I, 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 we can, we, we can discuss this in the Q&A section, but I want to add two other things that we will need to do for this to work, because it's not going to be just a question of expanding the customer ways. We need to tackle two perennial issues in financial systems in the region related to the need to improve contract enforcement. It is very hard to, in, to, to, to make contract enforcement in Latin America and the Caribbean. We need to solve that problem and we need to improve the quality of uh, financial information that is given in Latin America and the Caribbean so that uh, actors in the financial system can have uh, good uh, tools uh, or resources to rely uh, upon. Uh, in a word, we think uh, the, the, the key takeaway I want you to take from this presentation is that we need uh, to put the issue of generating saving or promotion of national saving on the uh, policy agendas in our region. Uh, we recognize that promoting education, health, and national security are all very important issues. We want to elevate the promotion of national saving to that same level, and that's what we try to do in this uh, uh, book. In the end, we would dream of turning the vicious circle we are trapped in now into a virtuous circle where we start with more saving that allows the financial system to grow, costs to go down, reduce the misallocation of, of, of saving, increase productivity, and sustain in the long run higher saving rates. That's uh, what we uh, strive and that's what we hope to do. So that was the introduction of the book. Again, as Thomas said, all of the book itself and all of the material supporting this book can be found in, in, and downloaded for free in, uh, through the IDB website, uh, www.iadb.org slash savings. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you just turn off the microphone? We've got two very thoughtful respondents, and then we're going to open it up. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. De La Torre. I'll give you a chance to make some comments, and then my friend Mildred Collier. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is always a pleasure to comment on this excellent book, which I have had the opportunity to do it already like a couple of times. Saving is, of course, a, a, a topic that has also been to the heart of my recent research. So I uh, commend the authors for taking the valiant um, decision to get into a terrain that is very uncomfortable for economists. And I'll explain to you why. You know, we economists are very conscious that whenever you see good things in economics, you tend to find also high savings. When you look at societies that take uh, good care of the elderly, where the elderly live decent lives, you normally find that there's a saving structure behind that. When you look at economies where there's high investment, you typically find that there's high saving there too. And therefore, when you look at economies that are growing strongly, you tend to find that they save well. When you look at economies that are stable, you find that saving is there. It helps to absorb shocks and to create greater stability. And so saving is associated with stability. And when you look at economies that export a lot, that are very good at selling things in international markets, you also find out that they save a lot. So economists are very conscious that saving must be very, very important. And yet, when you really put them against the wall and ask them about this, 
they fidget, they become very uncomfortable. Because the view of economies tends to be that saving is a result. So economies save more because it's the result of having other good things, particularly having growth and having income. So the general view of economies is that if you have high growth, good productivity, high income, saving will follow. And therefore, there is no good reason to be worried about saving. We should be worried about growth. That tends to be the mainstream view of economists. And so some people say, well, you know what, uh, uh, even to invest, you need, you need savings. So economists would say, well, if you are a small economy, and if you don't have enough saving because you're kind of poor, your income is low, so therefore you cannot save too much, don't worry. You should worry about investment, having good investment projects, because if you have good investment projects, foreigners will come. Foreign saving will come. And therefore, even if you have low savings because you're a poor country, don't worry. It's not a constraint. Foreign saving will come. So that's where the economic profession is trapped. So these guys are very valiant because they have gone into a terrain where they are not going to get published because <laughs> the profession of economists tends to stay away from this issue. But I think they are onto something very important. And I myself have been writing some papers that I'm having a hard time publishing making the point that saving matters in a casual sense. That saving, not only saving follows growth and follows income, but saving produces growth, is a cause of growth, and that we should therefore worry about it. And when people tell me, but you know, if you have good investment projects, foreign savings will come and they will, you don't have to be constrained by your low savings, then there's a lot of reasons, including provided in the book, that says, well, foreign saving is not a good substitute for domestic saving, for many reasons. And so I think we are bringing really a, a topic to the table that I think common, the common sense says it's hugely important. Everybody thinks it's important. You know, as, as Dan started saying, the numbers are staggering, so they, 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 are, they are big relative to other things. Mm -hmm. And yet the, econ the economics profession tends to shy away from that. So I think this is, I want, I want to first emphasize that. And then give you some sense of why I think saving really matters on its own, for its own sake. That it is not just a result. It is a result, of course it's a result. If you have more money, you would save more. It's also, it's obviously a result. It's an endogenous result of other good things, but it's also a cause of good things. So let me tell you two good reasons for that. One which the book develops very well, which is stability. National saving has shock absorption properties that foreign savings don't. In fact, foreign savings are bad <laughs> because they leave the countries when the country needs them the most. Capital flows come to the countries for reasons that sometimes are obscure because they go to the wrong places. But anyhow, when things get bad, capital, fl capital flies away. So. Domestic saving has something that foreign saving doesn't have. It has these shock absorption properties. And you've seen them time and again. Take, for instance, the latest commodity boom in Latin America. Which are the countries that are doing worse today after the commodity boom is over? The countries that did not save. Brazil is having a hard time, whereas Peru is not. They both got the benefit of very, very strong uh, commodity price increases. But Brazil went into a consumption binge. There was a consumption boom that ended up there badly, and so Brazil is now suffering from the absence of saving out of the windfalls. Peru was much more prudent. They had a windfall of commodity prices. They saved a lot. Their fiscal situation strengthened. Now they are doing OK after the boom is over. So these shock absorption properties of domestic savings are something that are unique. I don't think you find them in foreign savings, and that's very important for stability, and therefore for less volatility in healthier economies. But I have a feeling that saving also matters structurally. That it's not just a cyclical issue that you should save when you have a good time uh, for the, for the, for the uh, hard days. Structurally, high saving seems to matter a lot. And, and let me tell you one thing I find all the time in the data. Whenever you see high saving, you, f you find two things that are highly correlated with it. Mm. One, you have very competitive real exchange rates. So countries that save more tend to, tend, tend to be more competitive externally to be able to produce for foreign markets. You see that in Asia. 
Asia saves a lot and they are highly competitive. And the real exchange rate tends to be very competitive and that is consistent with their ability to penetrate international markets with high quality products. The other thing you find is structurally. Whenever you see, you never see countries that save more, they are countries that have, their productive structure is biased in favor of producing tradable goods and services to be part of international markets. So countries that save more have an orientation towards external markets and therefore have a productive structure that's oriented towards what economies call tradable goods and tradable services. That's a very strong correlation. I have found that in the data all the time. Countries that save less tend to have an economies that are oriented towards the domestic economy and therefore they have less competitive real exchange rates and they are less able to integrate themselves into international markets. For me that's an important, I think, a signal that there's a structural reason why saving matters for growth, not only cyclically to absorb shocks, but also structurally to have a, a more healthy, a healthier economic structure that's more conducive to growth. Now, so that means that we have to have an agenda and I agree with the book there. Despite of what mainstream economists think, I think we have to have a robust agenda of policy that aims at saving directly, not just at growth and therefore at savings indirectly, but that aims at saving directly. And the book provides very good uh, analysis of what can be done. But I have one more thing to say, and with this I would end. Having a robust agenda to, to strengthen your domestic saving, which I think is important structurally and cyclically for stability and for growth, doesn't mean that you should not worry about using appropriately foreign saving. And all of that hinges around the issue of how you intermediate both domestic savings and foreign savings. And that's a tricky matter. Intermediating foreign savings is very important because for all of this speech that I have given you that we need stronger saving in Latin America, there's a paradox. We're thinking that Latin America should save more in a world that saves too much. In fact, we live in a world that has a savings glut. So the problem from a world point of view is not that there is not enough saving, but there's too much saving and we do not know how to channel it for the right purposes. So there's a lot of hedge funds and all of these funds all over the world, lots of money and hunger in Africa. So something is wrong, <laughs> something is wrong. Now Houston, we have a problem in the sense that there doesn't seem to be a problem of availability of funds. The problem is how you channel those funds for the right purposes. And that's a very tricky issue. And we can discuss later why that's a tricky issue. Financial systems do not seem to be doing the right intermediation function of channeling all of this amazing amount of international funds available towards the right uh, socially efficient and desirable uh, purposes. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Mildred, thanks yeah. for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so, so much to, to pick up on here. I, I think just you know, from the, the perspective of, of OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, I mean, we are the US's uh, development institution that is focused on financing investment. So it's the side of the coin that um, uh, Augusto has just been, been talking about. And I think you know, part of the challenge here is <clears throat> those of us who are involved on the investment side are very transactionally focused. We rarely step you know, above the trees to actually see the forest. We're one star in that constellation, and we can't see the whole constellation. We see <clears throat> our star. And so <clears throat> we are so focused at the transactional level in terms of figuring out what is going to work to make this project uh, a reality. And we have tools, and those tools may or may not fit what's needed. And you know, we've just heard a, a really you know, important discussion about whether the tools that the multilateral and bilateral development banks currently use are the right tools to do uh, this financing on the ground in, the, in these markets. But I think you know, the other, the, 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 the big picture you know, takeaway for me is just that those of us who are toiling on the ground, whether we're the hedge funds or the 
the development finance institutions do need to understand this vicious circle and this potential for the virtuous circle. Because I think unless we can place ourselves in that constellation or see where we are in this forest, it's very hard for us to understand all those macro things that are going to affect the outcome of the investments that we're, that we're making. So I, you know, I, gu I guarantee you there's probably nobody at OPIC that is thinking about investments as the export of savings. But, but it is what it is. And I think you know, when you have that mindset, then you can begin to look at some of these issues that have been raised and really think about this. Um, and a couple of things that strike me um, in terms of this intermediation function, for example, um, it, you know, I think it's, it's both coming from the bottom up, um, the large informal sector and what kind of intermediation is needed there, and it's the top down, these huge pools of global capital that are looking for places to go and don't necessarily uh, find all the appropriate vehicles in, in the markets where they've got the confidence level and so on to make those investments. And then there's some size mismatches as well, both on the bottom up and the top down. But let's talk about the informal sector sector first, because I think that's really critical in terms of building this savings culture. Right now, and particularly in Latin America, what you see is just you know a disproportionate share of firms that are still informal. And what that means is that they are not contributing to this savings cycle in a formal way that can actually then flow through that virtuous circle. And so I think part of what needs to happen, at the same time it has been very important developmentally for the um, institutions uh, that we're discussing on the development side, the development finance institutions, the multilaterals and the bilaterals, to target the microfinance sector and to be sure there's adequate funding for those you know, sole entrepreneurs to start those you know, subsistence kinds of businesses. Yes, that's been important, but we can't stop there. And we have to figure out what is that path to formality for those you know, millions and millions of, of uh, microfinance uh, entrepreneurs that uh, would like to get into the formal sector, but there's a huge penalty. And that comes in terms of the taxes that you haven't been paying, the employees who are not you know, formally hired. It's the you know, licenses that you don't have to formally run your business. So I think if, if we want to tackle that and get those firms and the individuals who work for those firms into the savings culture, we have to figure out how do we smooth that path uh, to formality. And then once you get to the formal, small and medium enterprise level, where are the institutions that are going to either invest in you from an equity patient capital standpoint or lend to you on local currency terms or on some other basis that is sustainable for you to grow and, and thrive? Because that is how you're going to build that savings from the bottom up. And then when you talk about the um, external savings that want to come in, how do you, you know, really reduce that, that friction that exists there? And I think, you know, intermediation and, and better types of it are huge parts of that. Uh, but it's also the fact, um, as you point out, that the reason why we have this big challenge of, of external savings coming in is because of the currency mismatches. And if we can you know, build up the savings culture and get to that point of competitive exchange rates, that friction isn't so great. And suddenly, the fact that you've got one currency coming in to your market is not as, as such a huge dislocation or disadvantage or doesn't build up um, you know, expensive debt that governments can't repay purely because of that exchange rate differential. So I think there's so many reasons why this virtuous circle, you know, needs to needs to come together. But I think in the short term, you know, what do what do we do? I mean, I think in the short term, all of the uh, multilateral <clears throat> and bilateral lending institutions need to figure out how they can do more to support local currency lending, and whether that's helping build up the capacity of uh, domestic banks, uh, you know, providing guarantees and other things that will make them more comfortable going out longer term, uh, whether, whether it is uh, you know, supporting, as, as we are doing, uh, hedging uh, inst entities uh, you know, on a commercial sustainable basis that will uh, hedge in these more exotic uh, currencies, so, uh, because that's been the biggest problem, I think, particularly in the microfinance and other sectors, that the currencies that they 
want to lend in, just you can't, you can't buy a hedge. So uh, the MFX uh, group is, was one that we have supported, and they are able to you know, work with a, a multilateral institution, the, the currency exchange, that is, that is dealing in these uh, exotic currencies and help helping, helping some of those hedges happen. So I think in the, in, in the near term, that, that's critical so that um, there are more, more um, investments downstream can be in the local currencies. I think there's a, a bigger role for equity, that long-term patient capital, because that doesn't create that debt burden in the foreign currency that you know, is a real pressure on, on governments. So I think, um, you know, and, and that is something that OPIC has been trying to tackle for quite a long time. We do support equity funds, but we have to do it through a debt instrument because we don't have equity authority directly. And so we have to do it in a workaround, and we're still, you know, working in our, in our uh, U.S. dollar currency, which creates these mismatches. So I think, you know, institutionally, all of us in this development community need to look at these tools, look at the guarantee possibilities, and see what kinds of you know fixes um, there may be, and, and then I think that the other intermediation uh, <coughs> challenge is you know helping uh, as you build small and medium enterprises who have employees who can then pay into pension funds and pension fund assets grow domestically. How do you uh, really get you know those pension funds or insurance companies to invest in their local economies? And some of that is a regulatory um, issue. Uh, and I think, you know, it's not the entire equation. We had a little bit of this conversation um, earlier uh, that you can't, you certainly, you need prudential regulation so that, that, you know, really ridiculous investments are not being made. On the other hand, I think, you know, we see the pendulum swinging. And the question is whether some of the most competent uh, folks who understand how to intermediate capital, who are sitting in banks, who no longer can make these loans because of Basel III and other requirements that are making it harder and harder for them to lend in these poor markets, you know, have we taken some of the intermediary capacity off the table because institutions who used to lend into these markets um, are no longer doing so? So I think, you know, the regulatory regime is important uh, for banks, it, but it equally affects pension funds who have, you know, strict limitations on how much of their investments uh, they can make in certain categories or types of, of uh, investments. So I think, you know, it is, there's a there's a, a definitely a circle here and and at every point on that circle there's some intervention that I think can marginally help um, grease that grease that wheel so it goes around a lot more smoothly great thank you thank you okay let's open it up I want to take three or four questions and bunch them together this gentleman here other folks I want to see other people's hands we're going to take three or four questions together go ahead your name and your institution please my name is Robert Mines I used to be the uh, remittance specialist at the MIF and uh, at the inter-american uh, sorry at uh, the International Fund for Agricultural Development uh, first of all my thanks for uh, a tremendous presentation um, there's a lot to digest there I've got a million questions that I'd like to ask I'll limit it to one um, you talked about uh, encouraging banks to reach out to people who are generally unbanked um, I've worked in that area for, for quite a while, uh, something in the neighborhood of 50 different projects working with banks to do that. Um, in Latin America, it's, or let me flip it around, it's easier to start a business here than it is for many of these people to open a formal bank account in Latin America. So it's not just a cost in terms of finance, it's also a cost in terms of your ability to, uh, to, to spend the time to do something like that and your education level. Um, and from that point on, there are some institutions that are willing to work with clients who don't have a great deal of, of savings to mobilize. But generally speaking, uh, the model is the other way around. They want a low volume of high value uh, clients and, and it's a very difficult thing. So I, my question is, do you have models that have proven successful in mobilizing these sort of things for a for financial institution? So not for non-bank, but for an actual bank financial institution. Thank you. Okay. Other, <clears throat> other questions? This gentleman here. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name's Don DeAmesis. I uh, teach over at Georgetown Law School, International Business Transactions. Uh, I wear a number of different hats. I was also the general counsel at OPIC, the Overseas Private oh, wow. Investment Corporation. I serve on a panel at the IADB on fraud and corruption issues, prohibited practices. Uh, and I suppose the last one, MFX Solutions, uh, which deals with... Um, um, sort of foreign exchange hedging, I sit on the board of directors there. So I find this an absolutely fascinating discussion from a number of perspectives. I really have two questions. Uh, one is in terms of increasing the customer base 
you know, we've uh, there's microfinance. There's also this whole concept of fintech, and I guess I'd appreciate your sort of perspectives on how you are sort of moving, how that fits into the discussion. The second question is, uh, I'd appreciate any perspectives on the role that that corruption, which is you know endemic in lots of societies, uh, would play on this savings role. And and I know the IMF, for example, is now uh, upping its game in terms of you know sort of review on financial uh, issues. And I'm wondering whether you've given that any thought. Okay. Yeah. My name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a private sector and capital markets advisor, strategic advisor, and I have two questions, if Mr. Rundy will allow them. Uh, there are several mentions about exchange rates, but no direct reference to uh, foreign exchange reserves, and I'm wondering if you consider them a part of the savings discussion or if that is more of a trade and, and economic development issue in your minds. And the second is the question as to um, the underlying credit quality of the depository institutions into which you would like the uh, people to make, these, make their savings deposits. Uh, does that become a question of, uh, that uh, holds them back from doing so? Thanks. Good. Okay, that's a lot good. So let me see. I'm going to start with Mildred. Do you want to take on any of those? I'm thinking yeah, of reaching I, the unbanked is one of them. I was thinking you might be able to yeah, touch and, on, and, and on and among I, others. On the corruption point, because I think, um, you know, corruption is actually a deterrent to becoming formal as well. I mean, if you're an informal enterprise, you can hide. You're not on anybody's books. You're not on the tax collector's books. You're not, you know, the, the labor department or whoever doesn't have you listed. So I think I think corruption is a is a real, um, you know, driver of a firm staying informal. And I think so. I, I think it's a really interesting, uh, you know, point to to bring out here as we talk about that for a lot of other reasons why corruption has got to be addressed. You know, I think it's part of the informality equation as well. Um, and I don't know, the, the question about the, the models for the unbanked, were you, were you looking for models to draw in more savings, or was it on the savings side or the, or the lending side that you were most interested? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, certainly what we are seeing as we continue to work with the microfinance sector is that, you know, every one of those institutions is adding more and more services to, co you know, cover a broader spectrum of, of financial needs of their clients because they do, they do see that, you know, there's some revenue streams in there as well. Uh, so I, I think that's the one point I would make simply that every microfinance institution is looking at how they can reach out much more broadly, have a broader range of, of products and services. But, but Milder, let me just, while I have, <coughs> have you for a moment, just, I'm, I just in your various experiences, there might, I, yeah. I think of that, there's that German bank Mm -hmm. uh, pro credit. That? Pro credit. So, can you, are there other examples other than where you pro made credit? that? Where you made that uh, transition? I think. I think it. You know, there 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 are a number of microfinance institutions who you know are are are, are really um, you know very broadly based in terms of branches in, in many uh, countries. And many of them are trying to take that step up, you know, f certainly moving uh, from microfinance regulated to moving into the commercial bank space. I think there are some in India that have, have you know, successfully made that uh, transition. Uh, I think, um, you know, I think that's that's very possible on, on the lending side. I think, you know, making, making that shift, though, from lending on the microfinancing model to the more either asset-based or, you know, project-based lending uh, that you need at the SME level, that's a, that's a tough transition because the skill sets are very different. So some institutions try it and aren't very successful because their staffs are not necessarily equipped immediately to, to take on this new type of role. Okay. Augusto, could I ask you to just respond to some of the other questions? <coughs> yeah, or, uh, let, let me take um, two or three of these questions which are important. The question about corruption really brings um, the issue of saving to what's really important, which is the governance and institutional environment in which saving occurs. Uh, I have often said that um, saving is associated with dreaming. And let me tell you why. When you go to Asia and you ask the taxi driver, do you think your kids are going to be better off than you? Most of the Asian taxi drivers tell you yes. 
they have a dream about a better future. And when societies think that the future can be better for your, for your uh, kids, you save. But when you live in a corrupt society, where whatever you save could be confiscated, taken away, or siphoned off, you, you probably in equilibrium save much less. So these, these institutions, this social texture that allows people to look at the future with confidence, including the element of corruption, I think are hugely important for savings. That's why saving is so complicated, because in the end, the, the question that Eduardo was asking, how can we ask foreigners to bring their savings to my country when we, not either the locals, not even the locals want to keep their savings here? And, and they are Argentinians. They know what they are talking about, you know? <laughs> the Argentinians have their savings outside Argentina. And now Macri wants the foreigners to come in, and the Argentines are reluctantly thinking about coming back. But that's an important issue. So the issue of corruption <laughs> relates to governance, institutions, the ability to dream and to look at the future with confidence. And I think that's important for savings. There was another question about foreign exchange reserves and savings. To a large extent, the buildup of foreign exchange in, in emerging economies uh, in Asia, in Latin America, is a form of savings. Uh, not all of it has been funded through savings, but most of it has in some countries. And, and saving is a way of self-protection, right? It, you, you can self-protect against a health shock two ways. You can buy a, a, a health insurance and pay the premium, or you can save in case you get sick and you have savings. Well, saving is a form of self-protection. It's different than insurance. And countries that have been burned so often by capital, uh, by capital flows that uh, betray you whenever you need them, they tend to save more. And I think, for me, uh, international reserves are a, a kind of self-protection response of countries that are afraid that international markets are too fickle. They come in and they go. So I better have my own, my own savings. And I think that's how I see. Finally, the intermediators that you mentioned, the solvency of intermediations. I think it is solvency and a lot of other things. But it's crucial, right? Because here's the problem of saving. You have people that save money, and they put it in the bank. They have to make sure that they can get the money out whenever they need it with a decent return. So they have to make sure that the bank is not going under or that the bank does not misuse their own money. And then you have, on the other side, people that want those, that money. But look at the difference. The savers would like to keep their money there and available whenever they need it. The users would like to keep the money for a long time until they do the infrastructure project. So this is a market where the, the two sides are hard to bring together. And, and the financial intermediation process is one that should help us solve these issues, should help us make sure that even though savers want their money all the time available, they can, they can withdraw whenever they want, even though that's the, 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 the psychology of the saver, the user can still get money for the long haul. And so in the center, you have this intermediation process where you need solvency, but you also need ways of aligning the incentives and other things that allow this transformation. And I think the world has a problem there because of the savings glut. We have so much money, so much need. <coughs> so we cannot bring the two, parts of the, the two parts of the market together. As I was saying, we have money coming out of the years in international hedge funds and, and, and sovereign wealth funds and capital markets, and we have hunger in Africa. So that gives you a sense of something is wrong with the intermediation process that is deeply uh, and, and profoundly wrong. And, uh, and of course, uh, the IDB, the World Bank, tried to go around it. But in the end, we need to figure out more frontally <coughs> what is it that in the nature of financial intermediation prevents bringing the two sides together in a better way. Eduardo. Thank you, Dan. And, and let me start by thanking Augusto and, and Mildred for very thoughtful uh, comments and, and discussions, and all of you for, for a very interesting set of, 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 of questions. I'm not going to repeat uh, what, what has been said. I agree pretty much with, 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 with everything that has been said. I want to try to complement uh, on, on, on your question, in particular on the financial system, which uh, uh, brings me to, to, to some of the issues that we discuss in, 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 in the book. Um, you know, uh, there has been a, there are some serious problems that we have that sort of limit the ability of the financial system to expand 
uh, among the uh, segments of the population that uh, you would like to be covered by the formal financial system. One of those <coughs> deep structural problems is the issue of uh, financial illiteracy that we have in, in the region. It's very hard to ask people uh, to trust something that they don't understand. And by and large, a large segment of the population in countries in Latin America and in the Caribbean lack the sufficient financial literacy on basic concepts such as the interest rate or compounding or inflation and so on. So uh, needless to say, the workings of how the fractional banking system works and how the, so we need to put a lot of emphasis. Now, uh, it's worrisome to me that, for example, we do not pay enough attention to financial education, particularly, particularly at the early ages, right? We tend to acknowledge and recognize that financial education is important, but we start too late in Latin America and the Caribbean. We don't. Okay, uh, point taken. <laughs> uh, but in Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, it's very hard to find a country, there are a few exceptions, but to find a country where financial literacy or any basic course on financial uh, education is given at the uh, elementary, uh, middle, or high school uh, level. No, it's very, very hard uh, to find. So, you know, people uh, grow up without the basic tools they need, and, and therefore, you know, it's not uncommon to find that once they are given the opportunity to use a formal financial system, they don't trust it. There's a very interesting case study that is documented in the book, for example, whereby at some point the government of Colombia had the initiative to pay, uh, and, and this has been general in the region, to pay social transfers through a bank account. And they discovered very early that people received the lump sum payment from the social transfer and they withdrew the money immediately. So they started to explore why does that happen. And it's because people thought, the people who received the transfer thought that if they didn't take the money out immediately, that money would, be, would disappear after a, after a period of time. So they solved that problem very uh, simply by you know, coupling the transfer and the payment with greater information and the availability for people to check more often, for example, their balances and so on. And over time, as this has been evaluated, it shows that providing people the uh, uh, opportunity and providing people, you know, for, for example, to be able, simple things such as to be able to check the balance without having to pay a fee every time you, you check the balance, over time build, help to build trust because they, they would check more often and they would see that the money was still there so they didn't need really to, to take the money out. So those kind of things which uh, you know, we take sometimes for granted and we think that it's just a question of uh, you know, providing the tool, providing the, the financial instrument. These simple uh, sometimes innovations which like this we, we, we explore many in, in, in the relevant chapters of the book are really powerful tools to achieve uh, you know, the goal of uh, trying to promote and fostering the use of the financial system as a, as a vehicle uh, for saving. So I would say financial education is one, and also technology, but technology has a limitation, which is we are still in a region where you know, uh, cash is very prominent as a way of uh, means of transaction. So you know, the cash in, cash out has a cost, so it's very hard to implement technology in a way uh, that it's uh, uh, viable uh, when you have this cash in, cash out uh, transaction cost. So we need to work on that as well. So th those are two aspects that, that I wanted to bring attention to because they are not, in a sense, obvious, but they are very prominent. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not saying in other regions they are not prominent, they are very prominent in Latin America for sure. Okay, so much. No, just, uh He's a uh, good saver and a uh, uh, tango dancer. So, tango. yeah. No, just uh, to add that I, I really like the, the question the first time that we get it on, on corruption. Corruption is similar to uh, another way of uh, uh, understanding leakages in, in public spending. No? And, and we see the example now in, in Brazil that reduce a, a long term investment like in infrastructure virtually to almost zero due to, to corruption. So, it really affects at least. Uh, public uh, savings. 
Okay, our time has run out. Please join me in thanking the panelists.